Hello. Um, dear students, um, dear member of uh, Romanian Gesellschaft, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear audience, what a joy to introduce Francis B. Nyamju, a scholar, public intellectual, Weltburger. I don't need to translate Weltburger we are in Frankfurt. Welcome. Before going further, I mentioned the Rubenis Gesellschaft. I would like you to have a look on your tables. You have a whole range of forms. If you are still not a member of our Rubenis Gesellschaft, don't refrain to do it. You have these forms on your tables. And uh, welcome indeed, if you want to. Professor Nyandro is an atypical multitasker to adapt a computer-related vocabulary. His career is evidence of a highly eclectic thinker, and his profile should be highly inspiring for scholars of a younger generation. The multitasking Professor Nyamjo is a distinguished anthropologist, no need to say, and dedicated teacher. He is a prof prolific writer and novelist. This is a very important point, a very important point to a novelist. Francis Nyamjo holds degrees from the University of Yaoundé in Cameroon and a PhD from the University of Leicester in the UK. He joined the University of Cape Town in June 29 as Professor of Social Anthropology from the Council of the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, Kodesri, Dakar, Senegal, where he had served six year long, head of department of publication. He had taught sociology, anthropology, and communication studies at universities in Cameroon, in Botswana, before coming to South Africa. And he researched and written extensively on Cameroon, on Botswana, on Africa, and on the United States of America probably on Europe as well, as I will try to, uh, to tell you. Among his numerous research interests, I want to highlight his work on migrants, globalization, citizenship, media, and the politics of identity in Africa and beyond. Nyamjo is a careful uh, analyst of a relationship between Africa and uh, um, the rest of the world, the relationship between African development and relevant education. He criticizes what he calls education as cultural violence and has called for African universities to be rooted in African soil. Professor Nyamjo received a number of awards, um, among them the award for exceptional contribution as a professor in the Faculty of Humanities, um, the ASO African Hero 2013 Annual Award by the African Students Union of Ohio University, USA. In 2014, he received the Echo Prize for Literature and the 2018 ASUK Phage and Oliver Prize for the best monograph. Last but not least, Professor Nyamjo studies us, himself, myself, and many of, of yours. We are in Frankfurt, the most cosmopolitan city in, in the country. He studies us as bush followers in Amakrekre, Amakrekre meaning uh, strangers. 
in Cameroon and beyond, I mean in Frankfurt as well. This has given him a highly original link, uh, angle, for instance, on the road mass fall movement in South Africa. In one of the most stimulating analytical and ethnographic contributions to this debate, Nyamjo highlights the role reversal in which Rhodes, uh, this very well-known fellow, Rhodes originally as an amakrekre, means a stranger in Southern Africa, how these fellow managed to sideline the autochthonous population in Nyamjo's world, turning them stranger on their own native soil, their homeland. I've known Francis for a long time. The funny thing he says, is not me, it's you, he says, is that we have always met outside our respective countries <laughs> of birth. And this is true, <laughs> it's funny enough. You know? uh, this is true. Who better than Francis who, to raise the issue of people who, despite their apparent mobility, remain anchored in Bamenda or Bamako? Who better than you uh, to raise the issue of newcomers who impose themselves on the locals by force to raise the issue of newcomers to impose them by force or arms or money to the point of wanting to marginalize them forever. Let us talk briefly about a scholar enamored of ordinary witnesses to life who consciously navigates between the terrain and fiction and that of every social reality. Perhaps we should start there, recounting his experience as a field anthropologist. He actually takes us to, for a walk through the cacao plantations of Cameroon, his country, and in the footsteps of migrants scattered to the four corners of the world, whom he studies in minute detail. Unlike his colleagues, he was quick to head the advice of one of the, his favorite authors, Chinua Achebe, who wrote, let me quote this time, the world is like a mask dancing. If you want to see it well, you do not stand on one place, end of quotation. So he regularly took time out from anthropology to venture into the realm of literature. In doing so, he behaves like a frontier being, is your concept, frontier being, who laughs at this conception of bounded identity and exclusionary idea of being. So you are beyond this bounded uh, citizenship. Above all, um, he is passionate, you are passionate about the con conversation between anthropology and literature, about conversion, transcending any sterile, uh, sterile uh, dichotomy, so beyond dichotomy. The flexibility you sing about is common on the continent. Let us start with a literary version in Nigeria with a palm wine drinker uh, recounted by uh, Amos Tutola and taken up by yourself. And let me quote again. Something transformed can regain the state that preceded its transformation. A thing can double itself, and the double becomes the thing, and the thing the double. Gods are humans, and humans are gods. Spirits assume uh, human forms, and humans can transform themselves into spirits, animals, and plants. End of quotation. It was not Mamadou, it was Francis. <laughs> I owe these words to your highly dense publication list. Francis Nyanju is extremely uh, prolific author. 
research gate tells you that he got in a single side 137 works and cited 4 time, uh, 4,337 times. This is impressive. Uh, but do you know that while introducing him in 2021, one of his colleagues said admirably, I quote, over the last 15 years, Francis has produced one scientific book a year, not counting his novels. But now, in 2023, I, I think you are in 2023, right? In 2023, he published two of them. Let me, let me cite them. The first one is called Incompleteness, Donald Trump, Populism and Citizenship. And the second book is called African Potentials, Bricolage, Incompleteness and Lifeness. No one can explain these phenomena other than Dr. Uh, Arieta Nyamjo here somewhere in the system. Dear fellow of the African Academy of Science since 2014, dear fellow of Academy of Science of South Africa since 2016, dear chair of the academic board of STIA, Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study, mon cher Francis, word is yours. Vas-y donc, au combat. With such a deep words of welcome by my brother, uh, Mamadou, I'm lost for words. But I have a few words that I have prepared uh, 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 and I want to say them before uh, 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 we proceed. First, uh, words of immense thanks uh, to uh, Roland and uh, uh, Susan and uh, uh, Usla and everybody who has actively uh, uh, invested their energies to make sure that I'm here with you uh, today. And uh, as part of this prestigious uh, 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 encounter and this conversation that we are about to have. And thank you so much uh, for taking time of your busy schedules to, to be here uh, uh, for this conversation to take place. Uh, as you've seen uh, displayed, uh, we, in, in, the, in the four lectures that we're going to have, uh, we try to uh, arrange them around an overarching idea of the interconnections between uh, incompleteness, uh, mobility, and conviviality as I understand it. And I thought that uh, uh, today we would start uh, from where I ended when I appeared here briefly uh, some a, a year or so, some time back uh, just to give a, a talk. And at the time, uh, I talked about uh, uh, the events in uh, South Africa uh, around uh, the students' movement uh, that was uh, uh, known as hashtag Roads Must Fall. And the movement uh, started at the University of Cape Town, where I am based. And I thought, uh, uh, a way of introducing this lecture series is to start from, from, from that particular movement, what it teaches us about incompleteness and how if we anchor our conversations today on those movements, we can begin to uh, arrive at uh, uh, what I, I, I have termed a convivial scholarship. So let's start very briefly. For those who were not here when I visited last, I have some four short clips 
video clips to give you a sense of what happened at the University of Cape Town in 2015. And uh, uh, that has generated since then uh, lots of books, lots of journal articles, and the bandwagonism of uh, decolonization got a lot of momentum from uh, uh, Roads Must Fall, in addition to Black Lives Matter elsewhere in the US and UK. So let's start very briefly. They are very short uh, videos with uh, uh, the first of them. Thanks. UCT students have occupied the university's administration building in protest of a lack of transformation in the institution. Students have been protesting on campus calling for the statue of Cecil John Rhodes to be taken down as part of the move to force transformation. We are all white men now. Okay, after this uh, demonstration, uh, you will see uh, the statue was brought down. The next thing.
second video on the same thing, uh, giving you from a, a different perspective. A full 24 hours off the road is finally fell. A split group of UCT students is refusing to budge. They have been occupying the Brenda building on campus, saying they won't leave until the demands are met. Vice Chancellor Max Price gave the students till 2 p.m. to vacate the building. But members of the group dug in their heels. Yeah. So, in, in a way, uh, the struggle continued even after Rhodes had left campus. And uh, uh, I would like to show very just a, a snippet of the next video so you see the person who came in as our new vice chancellor. Second? Yeah, the last one. Yeah. yeah. Good morning. Good morning. My name is the members of the UCT community on the very first day of my taking office. I'm delighted to address you today for the first time as Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Town. It is an honor and privilege to be asked to such a world class institution. I have met and worked with many of you, students and staff, in the last few years, so I know the hard work and dedication that is the hallmark of this institution. I am proud to be leading a team, talented and committed team. I wish to assure you that I will continue to work very, very hard to advance UCT. I will work tirelessly with colleagues and students all over campus to ensure that we make progress on critical elements of our vision and our strategic plan so that we can deliver on the goals that we set for ourselves. Perfect. Our vision is to be an inclusive yes. Yeah, I think that's fine. I've given you a background uh, against which to uh, appreciate what, what I'm about to say. Uh, and under decolonization as incompleteness and conviviality. Uh, and the lecture explores how understanding of and the pursuit of decolonization of research and knowledge production, anthropological, ethnographic or otherwise, could be enriched by conversations framed around incompleteness, mobility, encounters, debt and indebtedness, compositeness of being, and conviviality as responses to the dangers of the essentialism that shape and have been shaped by colonialism and coloniality. Given the resilience of colonial education, the lecture proposes a framework of decolonization that draws attention to the equally resilient endogenous traditions of knowledge that are barely recognized and grossly underrepresented. The lecture argues for convivial scholarship that promotes conversations and collaboration across disciplines and organizations and the integration in the academy of marginalized epistemologies informed by popular universes and ideas of reality. Convivial scholarship is predicated upon recognizing and providing for incompleteness in persons, disciplines, organizations, and traditions of knowing and knowledge making. Critical to convivial scholarship is the extent to which we recognize and provide for incompleteness and mobility as universals and are ready to dis disabuse ourselves of the illusion of completeness championed by zero-sum games of violence and violations in which debt and indebtedness are outsourced to victims while compositeness and conviviality are underplayed or downplayed or caricatured. I see decolonization as a conversation of probing questions. We in academia in Africa and elsewhere 
have the tendency to confine colonialism to one of its most recent variants, what Europe or the West did to the rest of the world. What that has come with that has come the idea of breaking free of Western intellectual <laughs> traditions and customs, epistemologies, concepts, theories, methodologies, and ways of producing, circulating, and consuming scholarly knowledge. A dominant position is that such Western intellectual traditions can and should be replaced with alternatives inspired by and crafted preferably in non-Western contexts, or by spokespeople, Western and non-Western alike, and irrespective of where they practice, they practice their scholarship. In certain instances, claiming decoloniality takes the form of a refusal to use, engage, critique, or even to read sources of knowledge and framework, frameworks perceived as Western in origin. It is as if it is a given that if it is Western, it is bound to be inappropriate. In what follows, I seek to make a modest contribution on how our understanding and pursuit of decolonization could be enriched by conversations framed around incompleteness, mobility, encounters, debt and indebtedness, compositeness of being and conviviality as responses to the dangers of the essentialisms that fueled colonialism and coloniality. In a context, a colonial context, we essentialize people in order to dominate them by advancing the fallacy that they require enlightenment or that they have no culture. They have no history, no civilization or values to be able to compete favorably in the modern world. So let's do them a favor. Let us spread light amongst them. This tool of power can and often works very well. We could also essentialize in another way and increasingly uh, a considerable number of people are doing so in the clamor for decolonization by putting up a common front in, a, in struggle against coloniality despite our differences and the multiple uh, gradations that could set us uh, warring amongst ourselves. Although we are aware of the differences, we momentarily freeze or suspend them, ostensibly because if we are to make progress in the strategic fight in which we are engaged, it could only be as a homogeneous unit and a block. Uh, the freeze or suspension of differences and the fractures meant to be temporary with the understanding that once we overcome or per, uh, our pursuit, we, 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 once an, our overarching pursuit has been achieved, we can return to recognizing our differences. Essentialism has been used in ways that are both positive and negative, but the challenge is how to be aware and know how to free ourselves of essentialism and represent the complexities and nuance in the communities or, or, or communities of which we are a part. The idea is always uh, to protect freedom of thought and action for individuals acting in, in, as individuals or as members of collectivities which, uh, 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 with which they identify. How can African universities, for instance, decolonize uh, their curricula while uh, functioning in neocolonial spaces? How can we engage in the decolonization of disciplines while the state is a colonial state? How do we African scholars, schooled in and appreciative of credentialism and its hierarchies of resilient colonial education, reimagine and implement an alternative vision of knowledge, 
production that could uh, imply a loss of power or currency for those who have learned to get by within the oppressive, repressive and skewed system of knowledge making, circulation and composition, or consumption, sorry. This lecture is a conversation on decolonization where there are no definite answers but ever more probing questions. The day we stop asking questions about decolonization, it seems, will be the day it has been achieved. A case is made for decolonization in contexts and situations of failed absences, failed silences, and failed uh, underrepresentation. To put it differently, we talk about decolonization of scholarship, and within the academy, we are speaking the language of incompleteness. We are saying that what we have as scholarship, what we have as disciplines, what we have as epistemologies or theories, concepts and practices, what we have as traditions of scholarship, even though sometimes seemingly unbiased, less unequal and more useful in understanding things is incomplete. The curriculum is incomplete. It is dominated by certain ways of thinking, while other ways of thinking and knowing are marginalized and devalued. Demographically, there is incompleteness as well. There are curricula in which only a particular race dominates and dominates in a scorched earth manner. There are practices and disciplines in which only a particular ethnicity or race predominates, extracting the lion's share of visibility. It could be said that, it could be that a particular geography, particular people from certain continents or people from urban areas as opposed to rural areas or from a particular religion are most visible and the loudest in some instances. In other instances, people of a particular class, sex, gender, sexual orientation, or generation are either excluded, included or excluded, or seemingly included when in fact they are not. Those excluded are silenced and reduced to a passive presence. So in a way, when we talk decolonization, we are drawing attention to the underrepresentation of the complexities and nuances of being in a given context. This element of incompleteness is key. Now, how do we become comfortable with incompleteness as a way of being? Why do we operate in a certain area or context, disciplinary, uh, geographically or otherwise, and tend to feel that we are underrepresented, knowing that we normally are entitled to be there and to belong. When we have, uh, when we have the humility and the courage to embrace incompleteness, we are much more in an authoritative position to ask questions about the absences and the silences in these accounts. After incompleteness, the next thing that I factor into decolonization is the idea of mobility. Why? Because as humans and in our incompleteness, we are pushed to move around to fulfill ourselves. We are not uh, complete. We are not fully fulfilled. Our quest for self-fulfillment pushes us to be mobile. This quest, this curiosity, fuel, anxiety, this need to seek to fulfill ourselves pushes us to be mobile in all sorts of ways. By mobility, I do not mean uh, physical mobility. It could be the movement of our ideas, crossing borders, transgressing, even when we have uh, borders, border controls. Ideas can flow around into crossroads and crossovers. Some ideas, though enhanced by various uh, technologies, are able to flow more than others. Things as well move around. 
we tend to travel with the world uh, that we uh, have internalized and in the form of beliefs, values, and ideas, and we traveled with our material world as well, or at least part of them to the extent that is possible. In our motion, we move around with our internalized world and the external worlds of things. Mobility in this sense equates the freedom and flexibility that lead to mirrored uh, encounters with difference uh, without organizing uh, the differences into hierarchies of domination. The next thing uh, we have is that what happens when incompleteness moves around in a quest for self-fulfillment? Often, we move around because we do not have the monopoly of incompleteness, nor the monopoly of mobility. We tend to encounter fellow incomplete beings moving around, looking for opportunities and incomplete, incomplete ideas and things moving around as well. Mobility engenders encounters, and there are various forms of encounters. One type of encounter that pushes us to want to decolonize is what I call unequal encounters. In mobility that yields uh, equal encounters, we give and take, and we do not only uh, overly dramatize the idea of winner takes all. This would be wonderful. Nobody would want decolonization because we take from others and allow others to take from us it would be a win-win or a lose-lose. On the other hand, what if one moves around with ambitions of conquest, ambitions of imposing oneself over others? If one moves around animated by zero-sum games of winner-takes-all in the manner of Cecil Rhodes, if one moves around with ambitions to define not only oneself but also those that one encounters, if one moves around to impose definitions and deny people the capacity to define themselves, then there is a big problem. Most calls for decolonization draw attention to this problem of desired and effective dominance. In, in our mobility, some humans have tended to take advantage of others as if wanting to have the monopoly of being human or the monopoly of mobility, the monopoly of quest, the monopoly of wisdom, the monopoly uh, uh, of creativity and experience. In this regard, calls for decolonization point the flashlight on such unequal encounters. Now the question is, how do we ensure that decolonization provides for equality in encounters and interchange, where nobody has a monopoly of power, nobody has a monopoly of desire, where nobody has a monopoly uh, uh, of movement, nobody has a monopoly of incompleteness, but we are all we all recognize that we are incomplete beings forced to move around as a permanent uh, and uh, as a permanence and to encounter one another. What becomes the ethic of encounters, the model of encounters that will guarantee that we all get fulfillment without the fulfillment resulting in zero-sum games of winner takes all. What is really, that is really where the challenge is. One thing that leads to unequal encounters is the pretension or the belief that it is possible for us to outgrow our incompleteness in a permanent way. Whenever we find an individual, a culture, racial or ethnic community, beginning to think in very extravagant terms of our growing incompleteness permanently, or that it is possible to rise and acquire supremacy over all others to solve problems in a permanent way, we know that person or that culture, that racial group or ethnic community is becoming dangerous. 
Ambitions of dominance, conquest, and superiority are driven by delusions of linearity and completeness. And that is where the problem lies. For this and related reasons, I suggest we embrace incompleteness as a universal and a basis on which to contemplate and pursue decolonization. I also suggest that we embrace incompleteness as normal, not as something we should feel ashamed of or seek to outgrow because it is negative. Incompleteness is part of being human in substance, thought, action, and pro pro uh, projects. And it is, I dare say, a beautiful thing. Once we accept and embrace incompleteness, it informs our actions and mobilities, and we are not surprised when we encounter others, and we do not seek to immobilize them when we encounter them, because we do not have a monopoly of mobility. Even the way we discuss and relate to the histories of the people we encounter is going to be nuanced without derogatory assuming that they have always been frozen in time and space, that they are primitive, savage, pre-modern, or ignorant. We will recognize that others move around like us without seeking to conquer, define, and confide. We will realize, or should realize, that not every mobility has to be reflected in or defined by our mobility for it to qualify as mobility. We will be less driven to, to, to treat people as without history and more disposed to seeking to understand the local and global histories that have made them who they are. Put differently, we will be uh, interested in or curious about the history and aspirations as much as we are about their present. We will seek to, to factor in not an idea of cosmopolitanism that is only possible when Europe encounters, say, Africa, for example, but cosmopolitanism in its various locations and localities as constituted and reconstituted through histories of uh, mirrored encounters. The emphasis is on recognizing incompleteness as a norm and recognizing mobility as something over which no one has a monopoly. Seeking activation entails charging ourselves up through uh, relationships with others with, who are equally incomplete uh, and, who, and who are also in need of self-activation and self-extension. Living and letting live in a process of debt and indebtedness which we are all entitled to the monopoly of charging and uh, as, uh, the mutuality of charging, discharging, and recharging, something that I'm going to discuss in the third uh, lecture as uh, under ICTs as, as juju. Uh, we need to recognize different forms of mobility rather than reduce mobility to migration or migrancy, which focuses on the making of insiders and outsiders the entitled and non-entitled, citizens and strangers. Migrancy ensures that when we cross a border defined by another, we are leveled as an outsider. Mobility is much larger uh, in that everybody, everything has to move. Starting from uh, the human person, uh, our neuromotor system makes sure that we when we are born as children, uh, if we do not develop our neuro, uh, neuro system very well, or if, we, if there's a problem with it, uh, we cannot move ourselves in a coordinated manner. Mobility is a permanent attribute of our being. I, I suggest that decolonization should be a call for uh, us to recognize that uh, in our incompleteness, mobility and encounters, we incur debt and we are in debt. And no one has a monopoly of debt 
or indebtedness. Debt and indebtedness is what occurs to everything, is important, and it drives life. Whenever we, we move around as an incomplete being, uh, we incur debt, and uh, it, it, it therefore uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is contradictory for us to outsource our debts to others as if uh, 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 they, uh, we were uh, uh, outside uh, uh, the logic of, 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 of mobility and incompleteness. And therefore, uh, I suggest that as we in South Africa might put it, uh, we are who we are through other people, uh, cultures and natures as a product of what uh, we call Ubuntu. So we are all Ubuntu beings. The, 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 the opportunities that Ubuntu avails us uh, should not be uh, rewarded with opportunism. Debt and indebtedness are part and parcel of life. And uh, it is within that uh, understanding of uh, uh, incompleteness, mobility, uh, debt and indebtedness that I turn to what I suggest should be the way forward in our scholarship, what I term convivial scholarship. When I speak of convivial scholarship, I stress the need for us in the academy to converse and collaborate across disciplines and organizations and in a manner that integrates epistemologies informed by popular universes and popular ideas of reality. Given the resilience of colonial education among, uh, among the formerly colonized and colonizing, convivial scholarship draws attention to uh, endogenous traditions of knowledge that are barely recognized and grossly underrepresented, as I, I said earlier, even amongst disciplines like anthropology that have distinguished themselves by claiming to promote cultural relativism. Convivial scholarship speaks more of, of courage, humility, and a certain generosity of spirit a certain capacity to recognize our debt and indebtedness beyond the confines of our disciplines by listening to conversations across divides and outside of the academy, drawing on the experiences and wisdoms of so-called lay people who know what, uh, sorry, who know and have stakes in, in, in their communities and in universities uh, do not assume that they are uninterested in chipping in uh, into knowledge uh, uh, pro uh, producing conversations and drawing us uh, from uh, the ivory tower uh, and, and its expectations. Convivial scholarship is predicated on recognizing and providing for incompleteness and incomplete, 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 incompletableness in persons, organizations, institutions, ideas, disciplines, traditions of knowledge, uh, knowledge making and knowledge consumption. In the case of knowledge production on and in Africa, for example, convivial scholarship uh, promises to take us outside of simply diagnose, diagnose, uh, the diagnosis of African situations and uh, mourning about Africa being uh, subjected to a world of unequal encounters and power relations that subdue and submerge us. Convivial scholarship challenges us to do more than di uh, diagnose African predicaments. It frowns upon selecting, uh, uh, settling for chronicling or celebrating victimhood or accepting victimization and victimhood as a way of life. It encourages us to challenge the world of academia to take incompleteness seriously by disabusing itself of delusions of completeness and the zero-sum games of academics and knowledge production, share, uh, sharing, and consumption. It urges us to question prevalent, prevalent dominant templates that prioritize completeness which is an illusion. 
completeness can only be possible through refusing to acknowledge our debt and indebtedness and our compositeness of being. Through our mobility and encounters with perfect strangers and less than strangers, we take others in and become familiar with those we have encountered. The process of familiarization is a process of internalizing others. Through the process of internalizing others, we also export ourselves onto the world out there. Ideas that become global uh, usually start their journeys from a particular local context. And uh, as, there is, uh, as, as these ideas encounter through mobility, other ideas and other ways, they develop and rub off uh, one another uh, to, uh, who carry them to other conversations, organizations, and uh, communities. And before we know it, internalized ideas in motion have earned a foothold in our customs and traditions. So convivial scholarship challenges us to be generous with what we know and with our networks and not to assume that one can stand still and tall in splendid isolation and consider oneself a scholar. Scholarship involves conversations within communities of shared canons and shared ideas uh, of, of what and how we should seek to understand and interpret society and the realities. The least a scholar should do is uh, to satisfy their curiosities about a world in constant motion, to move with that world, as uh, 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 Mamadou uh, said, and interrogating the what, the how, and the why of things and processes that move it, but also the outcomes of those mobilities. Convivial scholarship is not about bending over backwards to accommodate in order to be accommodated by, so, by those determined to play zero-sum games of conquest. It is not to please those who continue to act with callous indifference to the predicament of the subjected. It is a scholarship for naming and shaming, impunities, its violence and violations. Convivial scholarship should not blunt or blur our efforts to continually excavate, explore, expose and address hierarchies and silences in knowledge production spheres in the academy. Rather, it is there to shine the torchlight on the epistemic and the related injustices that have come with the brutality, violence and violations of the colonial order. The, that is not uh, in doubt. The thing is, how do we move beyond merely disparaging that unless, uh, that useless and opportunistic template to enable those who have been silenced uh, to contribute and be dutifully represented and recognized for their con uh, contributions uh, to a truly inclusive process of knowledge production and circulation. Convivial scholarship is not a scholarship confined to Africa or to the formerly colonized. It is a very productive way forward universally. It opens up to so many uh, more forms of engagement if individually and collectively we rise to the challenge, challenge coll colleagues, regardless of geography, when we meet on Zoom and uh, at conferences, uh, conferences and seminars, when the scholarship is skewed, uh, we should challenge them, which is what gender scholars, uh, uh, spe specialists and feminist scholars do, and we can learn from them uh, towards building uh, and strengthening the idea of convivial scholarship. Increasingly, this is also what younger scholars do. So in a way, it is a scholarship that is alert to uh, uh, different forms of curiosities, different perspectives, different personality, positionalities, and the imperative of co-elaboration, collaboration and cooperation. 
and never allowing a discipline or an individual to rest on their laurels and stop thinking because they have convinced themselves that they are complete. Authorities and in authority. It is about conversations, not conversion. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.